Good evening, Brian, and welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, number 337, and our weekly lockdown lecture series during the COVID-19 pandemic. Brian, it's a great delight to welcome you along to meeting number 79. I thank you all for your continued support of these meetings, uh, particularly on such a, a beautiful day outside uh, that we're seeing here in the central belt of Scotland. Uh, Brian, uh, as usual, can I remind you of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidelines? Please keep your video on and a recognisable name uh, within the screen. If you do have broadband or bandwidth challenges, please just drop me a little note in the chat. Uh, I won't respond to you, Brian, but at least I know uh, that you've had to switch your video off. That's very much appreciated. As ever, can I also ask you uh, please to sign the virtual tile on our Facebook pages, Brian. Uh, as we go forward in history, uh, we will have a record of all those who've attended this le uh, lecture series over the last 15, 16 months. Well, Brian, it's, it's a great pleasure uh, this evening to, to welcome along one of the bro brothers that have a uh, joined our lockdown lecture series over the, the last year or so. And he's here this evening to talk about one of, in my opinion, one of the most uh, interesting stories of the craft in Scotland. And it goes back to uh, the, 70, the early 1700s uh, that this brother's going to talk to us about. And the He's going to give us a story about the founding history of the Mason Society at Hogfoot between 1702 and 1763. And without further ado, it gives me the greatest of pleasure to welcome to the Lockdown Lecture Series, Brother James Burns Hogg. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Gordon. Can I first of all start by thanking you, Gordon, and of course the Lodge of Hope Akrachi 337, for giving me this opportunity of delivering this uh, 79th uh, lockdown lecture, which is all about the founding history of the Mason Society at Hockfoot from 1702 to 1763. And I would like to start by quoting one of uh, probably the greatest Masonic, Masonic historians, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Brother Harry Carr, past master, who wrote a paper in 1950. And they started off by writing, on the 22nd of December 1702, in the little Scottish hamlet, of Hockfoot, a Masonic Lodge was founded, which flourished for 61 years until 1763 and apparently disappeared into thin air. Or did it? it con uh, its contacts with outside world and with the other uh, lodges in the neighbourhood were very few, and the only remaining relics of the lodge is the minute book, priceless treasure covering the whole of the known history of the lodge, and incidentally, the period which saw the close of one era and the opening of another in Scottish Masonic history. The present newly constituted Hopfoot Lodge, number 1824, was consecrated on the 24th of August 2002, 300 years after the first. Now, the consecration of the lodge, the new lodge, took place on the 24th of August 2002 in Selkirk. This was a charter that was presented to us on that day by the Grand Master, uh, which allows us to meet in three different lodges. Lodge St John Selkirk, number 32, the Gala Shields Lodge 262, and Lodge St John Stow 216. These three lodges' history was all tied up with the Hopfoot Lodge. This here is a picture of the consecration, myself in the centre there, the Grand Master, my right, the 109th Grand Master Mason, Sir Archibald Donald R. Ewing, and on my left, the then present, uh, the then uh, this, uh, provincial Grand Master, brother Edward George Keeper, who was also a past master of the Stow Lodge 216. This here is a picture of the grand officers who turned up that day, and the ones in the background are some of the founder members of the Hockfoot Lodge. And there's some more pictures on that day, and uh, the one at the top left there, uh, the five brands stand behind me, they are, they are from Holland, five of them are from Holland, but founder members from all over, we had Germany, says Holland, uh, England, America, and majority of obviously was from Scotland. So the three lodges, Stow, Selkirk and Gala, formed themselves at a steering committee and just before it started we decided to pick my regalia, which was uh, based on an ancient Gala water tartan, one of the oldest tartans there is, and uh, we changed it just to make it uh, unique to the Hockfoot Lodge. Uh, we took out the yellow stripe and replaced it with a blue stripe. The colours are red representing the Gala Lodge 262, 
and the Selkirk Lodge, the blue for race number 32, and for the Stour Lodge, two, 216. Also got a, a registered with the International Tartan Index. Uh, that happened in 2003, uh, so that's officially our own tartan. For the history of the lodges, by the Mason Societies, which I say started in 1702, we're also associated with the Selkirk Lodge, which was, was present at the Grand Lodge of Scotland in 1736. But it was obviously it's older. The Selkirk Lodge is older than 1730. We don't know how old the Selkirk Lodge is. There's no evidence, there's no minutes or anything. So nobody actually knows when the Selkirk Lodge came into existence. So there must be an operative lodge within the village of Selkirk before 1736. Then you had the big split within the, the Mason Society at Hawkfoot between the Gallus Shields Masons and the, the Stow Masons, which took place in 1742. Two lodges were formed in that day. And eventually the Stow Lodge applied to the Grand Lodge of Scotland in 1806 for a charter and were granted a charter. And likewise, the Gallus Shields Lodge, 10 years later, 1816, they applied to Grand Lodge for a charter and were granted their charter in 1816. Until you come, the circle is complete with the Hawkfoot Lodge founding. Uh, on the 24th of August 2002. Now, the original Hawkfoot Lodge. There was only three founder members of the Hawkfoot Lodge, because they were started up by it, there was no Grand Lodge, it was by inherit, inherit right only. Uh, the senior one was John Hawk Pringle Torsons. Hawk Pringle, because he was head of the Pringle family. That was, that was the title that he was entitled to use, Hawk Pringle. Uh, of Torsons, he was the president, the president of the lodge, that's an old Scots word for chairman, so he was the president, he was born in 1666 in Torsons House Stow, he married on the 29th of September 1691 Stow, and his wife Griselle Scott was uh, the daughter of uh, Sir James Scott of Gala, they had eight children, all of them died, with the exception of the third Margaret, who was born in 1698. Now, John Hope Pringle, sadly, he died in 1737 in Edinburgh. Now, his brother, James Pringle, also born Torson's, uh, Torson's house. He was a setter, setter Croft, the senior officer of the lodge. He was born a year after Torson's, 1667, in Torson's house as well. He married in 1700, and he died in Edinburgh in 1728. Now, the third founder member, Andrew Thompson in Galway Shields, he's a bit of a mystery this individual. There's no information on him. Can't find him anywhere. I've been searching for years for this individual. Uh, uh, the closest I can get is uh, an Andrew Thompson from Stout. But the minute book clearly state, states that Andrew Thompson in Gala Shields, unless he moved after 1702 to Stout. But I have got uh, uh, some information on Andrew Thompson associated with a family Thompson in Lauder as well. But I'm working on that. That's, that's why I'm going to uh, research that one. First meeting in the Mason Society on the 22nd of December 1702. There are six entrants. Uh, there's Sir James Scott of Gala. There's Thomas Scott, his brother. David Murray and Philip Hawk, James Pringle and Hawkfoot, Robert Lowry and Stoughton Heed, and John Pringle, who was a right in Hawkfoot. And you can see what they paid the entry fee. Uh, James Scott having the highest fee. It, all, it was all based on your, uh, 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 your place in society, determining which uh, entry fee you would be, your ability to pay. So you had uh, Scott playing seven, his brother Thomas play, paying three pounds, and the rest, who were artisans, uh, a pound each. For the privilege of joining the Hawkfoot Lodge. First meeting took place on the 22nd of December 1702, which was the earliest purely speculative lodge in Scotland. But why Friday the 22nd? Why not Wednesday the 27th of December, the Holy St. John Evangelist Day? Because you need five office bearers to be able to show statutes, presses, boxmaster, senior officer, junior officer, and a clerk. The lodge needed help, but from whom? You can't get any help from the minute book because the first 10 pages are missing, so we don't know what took place right at the start of the meeting. Only at the end of the meeting do we know. The Kelso Lodge was founded in 1701, and in 1702, the precious was Sir John Pringle of Stitchell, who was a family member. Uh, Kelso would have had its own meeting on Wednesday, the 27th of December, 1702, St. John Evangelist Day, so they wouldn't give that up to help any, another lodge, uh, not given up St. John Evangelist Day. But the Hawkfoot Lodge, First meeting was the 22nd of December, 1702. So what, what, what the Hawkfoot Lodge was looking for assistance, and I think that was the reason they, they called the meeting on the 22nd of December, the founding of the Lodge, because uh, the, the Kelso, they would have assisted them, because they were family members. That's my 
uh, personal opinion. Uh, and I think it seems to fall into place. Uh, thereafter, the Hockfoot Lodge did celebrate the 27th of December, St John's Day, right up to the end of their history. This year's a coat of arms of John Hockfoot of Torsons. He was a senior founder member of the Lodge. Now, the other thing was always rosy with the Pringle family. Uh, Hope Pringle's brother, James Pringle, uh, the old saying, making good men better in the craft, his brother. Well, James Pringle was a somewhat of a ladies' man. He, he must have been an embarrassment to his brother. He's twice appeared before the Stout Kirk session, charged with the sin of fornication. But John Pringle, to our sons, was a senior Kirk elder of the church in Stout and would have been part of the Kirk session who would have uh, passed judgment on his own brother. My ancestor, also James Hogg of Craig End, was also a senior Kirk elder, so he would have dealt with this problem as well. James Pringle first appeared in charges of fornication on the 12th of April 1696 uh, with a Margaret Rutherford, and his brother Torsons agreed to speak to him on behalf of the Kirk session. So that should have been it. He was fined a few shillings and he had to appear, appear uh, three Sundays on the trot in the, during the, uh, the church service on a Sunday, standing on the uh, uh, repentance stool and also covering the sackcloth that they, would, they had to wear. So that should have been the end of it, but no. He then appears for a second time, charged with the same offence, fornication, with an Isabel Patterson on the 18th of February, 1698. Again, his brother Torstons agrees to speak to him on behalf of the Kirk session. So he must make his wits end, uh, Torstons, try to uh, sort out his brother. Eventually, he managed to get married off in 1700 to one of the Pringle family, Christine Pringle and Luggett, and, and, and eventually moved a few years later into Edinburgh. Where did the founder members get their masonry? The three founders were certainly not operative masons. The family connection is one is of some importance because Sir John Pringle Stitchell was actually the second master of the Kelso Lodge in 1702 to 1703, just at the time when the Hockfoot Lodge was being founded. We find evidence of masonry in the family as early as the 24th of June 1670, when Torson's uncle, Mr. Walter Pringle, advocate in Edinburgh, was admitted brother and fellow craft by the Lodge of Edinburgh. The same Walter Pringle was also one of the witness to, witnesses to John Hot Pringle's marriage contract in 1681. Also included as a witness is Sir James Pringle Stitchell and his younger brother James. Now, the Hoffwood Mason Society, uh, the Lodge held 18 meetings in its history from 1702 to 1763 and they initiated uh, 104 members. Uh, you can see the majority of the meetings all took place at Hopfoot. But you consider that the, the, the Hawkfoot split in 1742 and the two separate lodges. So the minute book records all the Gallic Shields meetings uh, go up to 1763 as well, the meetings that took place there. But as you can still see that the majority of the meetings all took place within Hawkfoot. Now, Scottish Masonic Records, 1736 to 1950, which was uh, commissioned by the Grand Lodge of Scotland. It was Brother George S. Draffin who uh, 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 put this to, to paper, and uh, you can see that uh, Draffin, he placed the Hawkfoot Lodge eighth on the roll of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Uh, in his opinion, that's where he, he put the, the Hawkfoot Lodge. At the second meeting of the Lodge, 14th of January 17, 1704, no meeting took place in 1703, 1703, as that was a Sunday. As you know, you can't have a, a meeting on a Sunday. The first affiliation to the Lodge was William Cairncourse, of the Mason and Stockbridge. Uh, it was that Stockbridge Emra or Cockburn's Bath? They don't make clear and we don't know. It was admitted gratis, so that was free. He didn't have to pay anything because he was a fully qualified Freemason. Also, his brother, his son George Cairncross, uh, son to the said William Cairncross, because of his father being formerly a Mason and now a member of, of uh, this lodge, he was also given gratis. Didn't have to pay. And John Young, an operative Mason from Stow, who attended the sixth meeting of the lodge. On the 27th of December 1706, this appears to be the earliest re recorded instance of the initiation of an off the stone mason in a non operative lodge. And of course, you have the George Gray, the second affiliation, who was also an operative mason from Earlston. He attended the seventh meeting of the lodge on the 27th of December 1707, formerly an entered mason, we don't know where. He was not given gratis, which is strange. Because uh, he was a fully qualified after the interrogation, they found that he was fully qualified as a Freemason, but he wasn't given the same privilege as William Cairncross for some reason. Uh, he only attended uh, three meetings because he died in 1710. Harry Carr actually asked, we'll probably never find out 
what happened to uh, or why George Gray stopped attending the meetings, but uh, I did find out, I uh, found him in the old parochial records, uh, that he did die in 1710. So that was a good discovery. Now, the other question that was, we've been asked was about William Cairn Cross. Why did he affiliate to the, the Hockfoot Lodge? What was his association with uh, uh, the, the Brethren and Stow, the Hockfoot? Uh, well, I checked the cup session records for Stow, and on the 28th of January 1694, uh, for repairing the man's visit, George Patterson, George Haddon, writes, they were in Gala, and William Cairncross Mason to repair visit the man's sometime before the 8th of February and to be that day present at the visitation. Now, William Cairncross was the first affiliation to the lodge in 1704 and the first operative stonemason to affiliate to a speculative lodge. And on the left here, that's the copy of the actual cup session minute which explains all about uh, William Cairncross. So William Cairncross was, was known to uh, John Hopling of Torstone, because he was a Kirk Elder. He would have dealt with the uh, hiring uh, this William Cairncross to repair the man's in uh, 1694. So that's what, six, eight years before, uh, sorry, eight, ten years before uh, he actually joined the Hopfoot Lodge. So he, he obviously he was well known in the area. This here is a 20th uh, candidate, James Pringle, Laird of Tor Woodley. That's a picture of him there on the right. Uh, it's the only picture I've got of any of the members on oil painting. So uh, he was the sixth president of the lodge in 1710. He also went back in the chair in uh, 1714. There was quite a few Lairds joined the Hopfoot Lodge. You can see there are seven of them. Laird of Torsons, Laird of Gala, Laird of Fala Hill, Laird of Ashield, Tor Woodley, Middle Inn and Gala. Now, the box, the Hopfoot box, that lies in Grand Lodge. Now, this is another connection to my family for the, the hogs, because uh, William Murray, who was commissioned to make the box in 1727, actually married Bessie Hogg, one of my ancestors in the, the, the family farm in Craig End, and they were married in 1721. Uh, William Murray joined the Hopfoot Lodge, the Mises Society, in 1713, uh, married in 1721, and commissioned to make the box in 1727. Now, inside the box, if you go to Grand Lodge and uh, you'll see it in the, the museum, uh, inside the box there's a letter uh, uh, sealed uh, to the inside of the lid with four wax seals. And if you look closely at the letter at the bottom of it, you can see, just to make out RS, it's initials of Robert Sanders and the past master of the style is 216. And the seal has got RS on it, so that was his own, he sealed it with his own uh, seal. And it says, the, this oak chest belonged to the old lodge of Freemasons, which met at Hockfoot on the estate of Torslon Stow as early as the year 1702. From the old records, it appears that this chest was ordered to replace one used at, at, as a lodge box in 1702 and was made in 1727 by brother William Murray. The cost for wood and work was one pound ten shillings Scots and for iron work four pound four shillings Scots, equal to eight and five sterling in all. The chest, therefore, is 161 years old. Now, that was written in 1888. It is worthy of notice that this book is now in the possession of Brother Robert Sanderson, past master of 216, who is also the provincial grand secretary. This box has always been kept at Stow and was long in the hands of uh, our late brother, Brother George Hogg, past master, 216, as a member of my family. After his death in 1887, his wife, Elizabeth Walker, gave the box to his longtime friend, brother Robert Sanderson. Brother San Sanderson eventually handed the box into the Grand Lodge of Scotland before his death in 1906, and it's been there ever since. There's one question about the box. In the minutes, it clearly states there was only two locks, two keys for the box, but the one in Grand Lodge has three. So what, how, does, how can you explain that? Well, the first box, the lodge that was found in 1702, they needed a new box in 1727. So that's the first, the first doesn't, it's not the first, first box, obviously. The second box, I think the Gala Shields Masons took the second box when they split into two lodges in 1727, uh, 1742, when Hawkfoot Brown and the Gala Shields Brown went their separate ways because they had the minute book. The Gala Shields Brown had the minute book. And that's where the minute book was kept, within the box with the money. So they must have had uh, the second box. So when the, the Hawkfoot Brown started up the, the Stowe Mason Society in 1742, they would have to acquire a box for themselves. I think this is a box, because uh, uh, that, that lasted right through to the founding of the, the Stowe Lodge in the, uh, 1806. 
and uh, the box is still kept to this day. Uh, well, it's now in the Grand Lodge of Scotland, but it was in my family for many years for at one, one time. Now, this gentleman here is uh, uh, Mr. Michael Henderson from Melrose. I met him a good few, 15 years ago in the town hall Stow when they were giving a, a lecture on the history of uh, Stow Village. And uh, I, I mentioned something about the, the Freemasons and uh, how ancient uh, they've been associated with the village of Stow for so many years. And he, he approached me after the meeting. He says, I believe I have members of my family who are members of this Hawkfoot Lodge you're talking about. And I met him quite a few times and they uh, uh, found out they had two members of his family who were uh, members of the Hawkfoot Lodge. And one of them was actually the past president of the lodge. And uh, Michael Henderson was that impressed with the, the history of this lodge. He handed me two Bibles. This was the first one. It dates back to 1728, and it lists members of the Henderson family in, his, in, the, in, the, in the Bible. He also gave a second Bible from 1806 onwards, listing all the family. This is one of the pages uh, with inside. You can see it dates back to 1729, 1728. Uh, so it mentions that William Henderson Sr. was initiated on the 27th of December, 1721. And he was president in 1726. He was married in 1727 in Stow, and his son William, who was also initiated into the lodge on the 27th of December 1725. So these Bibles were handed, I handed them into Grand Lodge, and Grand Lodge agreed to get them uh, rebound, and they're in beautiful condition now. That's the one display there in Grand Lodge. So Grand Lodge done a beautiful job in getting them restored. So it's another artifacts we have associated with the Hawkfoot Lodge. If you ever want to find out where the Hawkfoot Lodge is, one of the best maps you'll get is, uh, you've probably heard that the, uh, the, 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 the William Roy military map. It was made after the Jacobite Rebellion in 1745-1746. Government was that lack of knowledge they discovered of the roads in Scotland. They commissioned uh, Major General William Roy to uh, map out the whole of Scotland. He done a fantastic job. It was actually the start, it was that good a job. It was the start of the Ordnance Survey uh, maps. He was, a, he, was a, a, he was the one that started it all. It's a beautiful map. It's colour coded. Uh, red builders, apparently, for the military, if they, if you could actually billet your troops. So it's quite a, hand, a good thing to have uh, this map. And it's a very detailed map. You can see there, there's the, the hawk foot. And that road there, that's a stagecoach road. The stagecoach that runs from Galley Shields to Edinburgh. There's Hawk Head just up from it. Now, England's always try to claim everything that's Scottish. Is their own. And he has got a plaque down the London Milton Head, uh, the birthplace of Major General William Roy, 4th of May 1726 to the 30th of June 1790, from whom military map of Scotland made in 1747 1755 uh, grew the Orden Survey of Great Britain. Now, but, uh, I can assure you, William Roy is not English, he's Scottish. He was born on the 4th of May 1726 in Carluke, Scotland. And there's his birth recorded there in the old parochial records for Carluke. William, son of John Roy, was born on the 4th of May, 1726, Carluke, baptised May the 12th, witnesses Mr. Walter Lockhart and Mr. Gavin Mack. So he's definitely Scottish. Here's another map I found that was associated with the, uh, the Hawkfoot and also it was actually made for the Grand Master Mason. Uh, 76 to 176, it's through Charles Bruce, 1st, 5th Earl of Kilgan and 9th of Kilcardin, and it was made by a brother, John Lowry, for the, uh, for the Grand Master Mason. This is, a, this is the part here that I'm interested in. You see the hot foot, and you see hot head. That's where the gala water and the logit meet. Now, if you're on a walk, if you've got a walk in the borders, you got in the hills, just above where the hot foot was, you can see here the A7, the gala water, the railway line, and the old gala road, which uh, connected uh, Herriot and gala. Uh, top field here was Hawkfoot Field. There's a fit separates them. And this one here, this is one the field that interests me. This is what I call it the Hawkfoot Field. We don't know exactly where uh, the Hawkfoot uh, uh, Stagecoach Inn was actually built because there's not a stone remains now. It was either the, the top end of the field or the bottom end of the field. I think personally myself, I think it was near the bottom end or the centre of the, uh, the field. Uh, that, that is the Hawkfoot Field. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, why, why here? Uh, Hawkfoot was uh, re re regarded as, a, an, as 
an effect outside the boundaries of civilization, isolated on open ground and thus a suitable place for, for meetings. A day's journey for a baratune without the bark air dug or the crow of a cock, as the ritual space. Now, again, we come to 1735 in the lodge's history, and the lodge was beginning to suffer for attendances. You can see there was only seven Brenton turn up at the meeting on 27th of December, 1737. It was actually the last meeting that John Hope Pringle uh, attended. His health was beginning to fail him. He was attending Edinburgh quite regular where he was getting uh, medical treatment. Uh, there was only three uh, Brenton from Gala Shields. And the Gala Shields, I should actually add, the Gala Shields the Brenton were never happy at the meeting at Hope Food. They always wanted to have the meetings in uh, Gala. Uh, they, they held their time because uh, Torstens con controlled the lodge that much. Uh, he, he always won his arguments. And so sadly, the following year, 17, uh, in 1737, uh, Hot Pringle died. He died in Ember on the 21st of December 1737. was buried in the old kirkyard of Stouth three days later on the 21st of December. That's a copy of the old parochial records. Uh, for Stouth, John Hot Pringle, Torstens Esquire, died Edinburgh. Uh, on the 21st of December 1737, was buried in his own burial place in the churchyard of Stow. Uh, death of Hope Pringle Torstones, last of the founder members to die as well. He was the last the three, he was the last one to die. In Walter Scott of Satchel's Materical History of the Scots and Elliots, there's a poem dedicated to the very honourable and right worshipful generous gentleman, John, uh, John Hope Pringle, Laird of Tussons, beginning, says, Providence has given you wit and store. Live as your worthy father did, live you before. So that was written on behalf of John, John Hope Pringle when he died. In 1690, John Hope Pringle was appointed a commissioner of supply for Edinburgh and Berwickshire. In his will, an inventory of his goods made by him on the 21st of December, 1712, that's 10 years after the Hope Foot Lodge was founded, uh, on page 280, it is recorded, some rights tools valued at one shilling, two small compasses, three Bibles, ten jewels, three swords, and old gloves. I like to think they were a, like a, a box or something he had with the stuff he used to take to the meeting with him. Uh, the thing that interests me is the uh, ten jewels. Why ten jewels? That's interesting, that. He was also the head of the, one of the most powerful families in the Scottish borders. So getting on now, we're coming close to when the, the fallout with the, the Brown took place. Pringle, John Hope Pringle is no longer with us. You can see there's in, in 1738, only one brother from Stow turned up. Uh, the majority of them were all for Gala and Selkirk. And by the way, I was able to identify uh, colour coding them. If they're green, they're from Stow, red from Gala, and blue from uh, 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 Selkirk. So one guy uh, from Stow. So you can see that the, the Gala Brethren are going to see they can actually take over this lodge if they ever went into a vote. And it did happen. 1739, only four Brethren from Stow. And it was a vote taking. The next meeting, Peter Gala Shields. The, the Stow Brethren must have known there was no chance to them winning a vote. So the Gala Shields Brethren. I've always wanted to move because they've been recorded various different times of the years since 1702 that they put in protest. They were not happy with the Gala Shields and eventually they got their way in 1739. So we're in uh, December 27, 1739. The Stow last meeting. This was the last time they meet the Brown for Stow turned up. Which day the meeting had been met at roll call called, so there was 21 members present. Of course, there was a discussion about uh, where the, the meeting should be taking place and agreed, it was like a compromise, you could say, agreed that the next meeting would be up stout. Minutes signed by the presses, perhaps, this is the only time this happened, by the way, that the presses had to sign the minutes. Perhaps this was the insistence of the stout, Brown, because they, they probably felt they were going to get beat here every time there was a vote. So what's the point? So they got the presses to agree to sign this, and that means that one meeting would take a year, one year it would be a stout, but next it would be Gal and so on. So that was 70, December the 27th, 1739. So the next meeting would be in uh, 1740. Sorry, uh, that would be December uh, 27, 1740. Uh, there were two meetings that year. 
which day the mace would be stopped. Remember, it was agreed that they would be meeting at Stow. It's got recorded in the minutes. Which day the mace would be stopped from going to Stow, according to the last, the last minute, by the extreme extremity of the weather, met a gala shields. Roll a uh, been called, found present, gala and circuit brand, but no Stow brand. The Stow brand, of course, would have been uh, attending the Hawkfoot, the hamlet of Hawkfoot, not, not in gala. But the excuse for the Gala and Selkirk Brown was it was that the weather was that bad. First time that were harmed. So I think that was the final straw for the Stow Brown. And you can see uh, the next meeting, 1742. Now, there was no meeting in 1741 for, for whatever reason. It wasn't a Sunday. It was a Wednesday that actual meeting fell on. So I don't know the reason why there wasn't a meeting in 1741. I think there was a lot of confusion going on between the Brown of uh, Gala and Stow, and uh, Stow Brown had no intention of turning up. And you can see in 1742, there was no Stow Brown there. It was all uh, Gala and Selkirk Brown. 15 of them, though, did turn up. And uh, the Masons, you can see they called, they called themselves the Masons of Gala, seals separate from the Brown of Stow. That's all recorded in the maps. Now, the Lord Ritual. The first Freemason by David Stevenson, that's a green book, it's sold in Grand Lodge. Quote, the Hawkfoot Lodge was highly unusual in that it did not have a warden. Again, demonstrating that although the Hawkfoot was not completely new type of lodge, it did differ in some respects. It never worked a third degree. Dr. Stevenson, 1988. The requirements for a lodge meeting were clearly minimal. All that was needed was a room and privacy. The elaborate lodge described by the Catechism was not a real building, but an imaginary one. Though no doubt the rooms in which meetings are held were, were uh, to some extent laid out and marked to indicate the main features and orientation of the lodge. Dwelling house and uh, alehouses were not only readily available, they were convenient from the, the point of view of serving food and drink to members, which is very important, partaking of the convivial side of lodge activities. The Hawkfoot Inn was one such place and probably de determined by the proximity to Torson's house, which was just up the hill the residence of John Hope Pringle. Now, the first degree, about 10, uh, only took about 10 minutes to work. Now, you've got to consider this way back in 1702, we were the first to work this degree uh, that we know of. And remember, they got an eight apprentice degree and their fell off craft degree. And it couldn't have took no, no more than 10 minutes because there were six candidates that day. Imagine if, uh, it was, in today's terms, it would take about six hours to initiate six candidates. Take, well, probably more longer, a first degree and a second degree. So it was a very short ceremony. And it's recorded in the minutes that uh, six interests, each of them by themselves, were duly orderly admitted apprentices and fellow Croft. So halfway through the ceremony, the candidate would be taken out. He'd be instructed in the secrets, and when he came back in, he'd wear this big floppy hat, and uh, he was learned to make a very ridiculous low bow, and shout at the top of his voice, God bless this honourable company. So that, that's, but that was, this hat here was actually uh, used in Stow from 1690 to 1770. It was used at the installation of the Burgessman of Stow, had to wear an enormous cock hat with a rim of foot broad. It was known as a stow hat, but they said that the last Burgessman, 1770, to own it was a man named Andrew Henderson from Wadder, who cut a pair of soles from his slippers out of the brim, ultimately landed the Abbotsford minus part of the brim, as Sir Walter Scott was keen on collecting such relics. Sir Walter Scott was a frequent visitor to uh, Stow, and he did have family members living in the village of Stow. Development of the ritual, the Hawkfoot Mason Society, following the custom of uh, contemporary lodges and the, and the admission of non-operatives, conferred these two degrees in a single session, making them virtually into a single ceremony, which they gave as their first step. But their second step was an uh, additional ceremony, which would in fact have been known as to an operative fellow of craft or master stone mason. So the two, 200, uh, 325 years of Scottish ritual from the first name of manuscript, three pages in 1696 to 160 pages, 1961. 
And that's it there, a type uh, copy of the Rembrandt's manuscript, page one, which I call it the Holy Bible Masonic Ritual. It was the first uh, Rembrandt Register's manuscript, 1696. Uh, the Hokut Fragment also goes with this. That's it there. You can confirm the partly word for word, uh, being the first page, well, page 11, because the first 10 pages in the Hockfoot Minute book were torn out of the lodge. Uh, so you can see right after these one, two, three, five lines on the same day, so it carries on with a minute. But we'll never know now what, what was the uh, seed in uh, these other 10 pages. They reckon uh, six of the pages must have completed the ritual, the written ritual, and four pages, they, they, they just don't know what they mean in those four pages. There's an actual copy of the actual uh, Edinburgh House manuscript discovered in 1930 in a lawyer's office in Edinburgh. There's page two and three. And there's page three of the Edinburgh House manuscript. The bottom there on the top is the Edinburgh House manuscript. But those five lines compared to the, the, the others are quite similar. You, you can see it hasn't been copied word for word. But it says it's, it's, you get the same message. So the Hopefoot fragment, first lines of the text provide one of the most interesting of the many problems that are, are abound in this uh, minute book. So who was the first to give to the world the history of the Hopefoot Lodge? Well, in 1988, you had Dr. Stevenson in his book, which Grand Lodge sells his book. In 1950, you had the brother Harry Carr, uh, his paper, uh, very interesting paper, highly recommend you, uh, if you're interested in the history of the Hockfoot Lodge, that's the one to get. Possibly uh, Trevor Stewart's, uh, he got the uh, Memorials of the Hockfoot Lodge reprinted in 2002 in time for the founding of the Hockfoot Lodge. Also, as, as a good one is the brother W. Fred Vernon, past master of the Kelso Lodge, number 58. His history of the Freemason in the province of Roxburgh, Peoples and Selfridge, in 1893. Uh, but only if Fred Vernon was able to uh, read and study the Embrace manuscript, which, as I said, was not discovered until 1930. I wonder what he, made, he would have made of that. Likewise, uh, Brother Robert Frank Gould, late past master, barrister at law, Gould's history of Freemasonry in 1886. I wonder what he would have made of the Embrace manuscript. But it was this individual, Brother Robert Sanderson, past master, Stout 216. He's also Provincial Grand Secretary of Rockford Peoples and Selkirkshires, 1863 to 1902. He was correspondent to the following newspapers, the Scotsman newspaper, the Glasgow Herald and the Southern Reporter. He was born in 1825 in Gala and died in 1906. If only Brother Robert Sanderson had been able to read and study the Emory's Manuscript in 1696. This is one of the pages from the Freemasons magazine, uh, 1869. So that's when the first print to the world about the, the, the unique uh, circumstances surrounding the, the Hockfoot Lodge. But how did Robert Sanderson get that information? It was actually another member of Stow, Brother David, uh, the Reverend Brother David Waddle, who was a master mason of the Stow Lodge 216. Uh, he actually heard about this minute book up in Selkirk and he actually got a loan of it and he copied it, exact copy he made, and he gave that to Brother Sanderson, who done his studies on this uh, unique lodge. Now, this is an old, an old PR for Stow for 1764. Uh, John Hopring of Torsons, who died, I said, in 1737. He married, he married Grizel Scott of Gala, and he, they had a daughter, the only one to survive who ate, Margaret Pringle. She married another member of the Pringle family, Gilbert Pringle. They had a, a, a daughter called Frances. And when Frances, uh, she married a George Veach in 1764. And uh, when he had a son, James, who was born, the witnesses to that birth was one of my ancestors, James Hogg of Longmuir, along with Gilbert Pringle of Torsons. Now, the Stow Mason Society says the lodge split into two separate lodges. The separation lodge in 1742, where Stow separate from Gallus and Selkirk Brim. Lodge of Dalkey, coining number 10 minute book in March 1806, five members of the Stow Mason Society passed and raised at Lodge Dalkey, coining in 1806. So you've got the formation of the Stow Lodge, 284 in December 1806, separation of the Society from the Lodge, uh, 9th of January 1866, and the last mention of the Stow Mason Society in 1900. Okay. Now studying the, as I say, the farm, my family are uh, 
been um, associated with the village of Stow for about 300 years. And I, I collect basically anything to do with Stow, I collect. I, come, I went to the National Map Library about 10 years back and I came across this map. They've got the original. And slightly, it's a, a, a map It was done by William Hall, Survey of the Lands of Stow, Stage Hall in 1780. And this, that's the village of Stow. There's a little courtyard there. And uh, the, the land, the farmland, it's a plots of land that got numbered. And I could just make out in pencil numbers. I named the side, uh, certain it was uh, one, two, uh, five, five different names, uh, two plots per name. That's my ancestor there, George Hogg. That's where actually the present new church is built when that day two plots. And uh, then I got realized that, well, George Hogg, I knew he was a founder member of, he was a member of the Mason Society. It was also a member of the, the new Stow Lodge of 1806. Also, Andrew Wilson, his son, was the first uh, master of the lodge, and he was uh, passed and raised in Dalkeith Lodge. William Main and the guy Brown uh, they were, and Pringle, they were all members of the, uh, the lodge in 1806. So I think this is all associated with the Mason Society, like a court society, looking after the, 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 for their widows and uh, illness and all that. Uh, they must have grew their own crops or something, and the land must have belonged to the Mason Society. And just to finish up now, the, the minute book, as I say, is concerning the uh, uh, Dalkeith Quadding number 10, the, the 20th of the March and the 20th of December, 1806. So Dalkeith, the law has been opened this evening. Petitions were uh, presented by George Hogg of the Mason, Thomas Reed Farmer and William Brown Wright, all apprentices belonging to the Mason Society at Stow, past and read. For whatever reason, the Mason Society at Stow, they never ever uh, uh, initiated, uh, uh, sorry, passed or raised a brother. It was just an initiation you got. So they had to travel down to Dalkeith to get their second or third degrees. So a further two brethren on the uh, 29th of December 1806, they travelled down to Dalkeith for Alexander Wilson. He became the first master of the new style lodge and John T. All apprentices from the Mason Society of Stow were passed to raise, paid their fees. Okay. And that concludes. Brother James Burns Hogg, thank you so much for such a, an interesting take on early Scottish Freemasonry, particularly down in the borders, but also the, the connection to your own family. Uh, I, I know that you've done a, a huge amount of history uh, research into it, not only for your family, but because of the interest in masonry. And uh, I, I think it was a, well, I know it was a great pleasure to listen to that this evening. And I'd like to, to commend you for all your researches and keeping alive the history of the Mason Society at Hogfoot. And that culminated in the, the new lodge of Hogfoot. Uh, that you are very much a part of uh, the foundation of. So thank you so much, sir, for coming along here this evening and giving us that insight. I'm sure we will have uh, questions in the chat box for you. Uh, and let me just scroll back up and get through all the evenings. Even Vance from California, oh, be safe with the smoke and the fires out there, Vance. Uh, even in Hong Kong. Kiltarlity up north is struggling with our broadband again, James. So, uh, Robert Clark, our immediate past master. Excellent presentation, very interesting. Ian Kennedy, mystery, intrigue, and scandal. What more could you ask for? Uh, Ian Wall, what a lot of data and information, and yet you feel it's only just scratching the surface. Fascinating. Well done, Jim. Very interesting. Uh, no questions, so what a wonderful piece of research. Uh, I do have a question though, James. Mm -hmm. Hot Pringle of Torsons, connected to the famous Pringle of Golf jersey fame that many of our brethren have worn over the years? I believe that would be another branch. The Torwood Lee branch, I think, they were... Uh, Pringles that were into that. That was that part of Gala that they came from, in between Stow and Gala. Mm -hmm. And that actually still exists. I met up with uh, uh, the family, and uh, uh, Torsos Branch is no longer with us, unfortunately. But uh, the Pringles of Torwoodley, uh, one of them, as I say, was a past president of the Hawkeye Lodge twice, 
they're very interested in the history. Uh, just like the Scots of Gala, I've met up with the Scots of Gala, and they're also very interested in, uh, uh, I've actually uh, went and met John Scott of Gala, and he gave me certain uh, uh, heirlooms, shall we say, loads Dipl of diplomas uh, associated with masonry and his family history. And I handed them into the Gala Lodge, so the Gala Lodge now have them in their museum. Mm -hmm. uh, Andy Ferrer asks, what's a box master? That's the guy who's in charge of the monies. In the box, the box was the, well, you would get three key holders would be the box master, the secretary, and usually the presses. Uh, that's why the box had three keys. So you couldn't actually open the box until three was present. It was the same as the church. My ancestor, James Hogg, he was uh, one of the box masters for the church. He had the honour uh, actually taking the box home with him and keeping it under guard, uh, the monies, and he was one of the key holders for uh, that. So the three of them had to be present when the box was, was at the meeting. They could only open it at the meeting when the three were present. Uh, thank you for that, James. Uh, Ian Walker uh, says he's noticed on the attendance record some of the names had PP after them. Did that stand for past presses, effectively yes. past masters? If so, uh, it was a lot like some lodges today, mainly past masters keeping them going. Well, no, I think it, most through the history, they all eventually went to the chair. They all had an opportunity to go to, most of 